What's up guys, back again with another video. This episode I'm going to introduce you to object-oriented programming, which is the most popular programming paradigm, and will get you started to becoming a real programmer. The first thing I want to do is explain to you what we have been currently using, and that is procedural programming. Procedural programming is a paradigm or style of programming that is focused on functions that manipulate data. These functions I just mentioned are known as functions in C++, but conceptually are known as procedures, hence the name procedural programming. When working with procedural programs, the program is often a function call, one after another, step by step, which executes a set of statements. And of course that starts from the main function that we have always implemented first. It would be nothing without working with data, so you will have variables in between that are passed from function to function to be manipulated and accessed. I hope this sounds familiar because this is exactly how we have been structuring our program so far. So we have been using procedural programming, which is again a style of programming, but now we want to move on to something more advanced, which is object-oriented programming. So procedural programming can only get us so far, so when more complexity is needed in programming, the idea of OOP, or object-oriented programming, can help us. Rather than the central focus being on procedures or functions, the focus is on objects. An object is simply another data structure that we can use to make custom data types in our programs. And in C++ it is almost identical to structures, but there are some important differences, especially in the way it is used. I'm not personally all that experienced, I'm not going to lie to you, but objects and classes are definitely used with object-oriented programming in mind, and structures are left to be used with more simple stuff, like uh, very, very simple data types that are not, you know, very complex, basically. And um, we'll see that more later on when we start making complex programs. But everything we're going to learn now with objects and classes that we didn't learn with structures can be done with structures, but we won't be using them. Like I said, it's going to be for the basic stuff. An object is unique in that it groups together data and functions into one entity. The functions that are inside the object will be used to manipulate the data inside. That is really helpful because functions, as you'll see, provide an interface to the data rather than allowing the users to directly access and edit an object's internal data. This plays into the concept of data hiding and we'll explore that very soon, so don't worry. So now let's walk through how we can create and use objects in our programs. So to create objects, you actually first need to define a class, which is how you model and design the object, just like we would do with structures, right? Whenever we make a structure, we would first uh, define the structure at the top of the program, so we can define what the structure, um, how it's modeled, right? So if we're going to make a dog, we would say something like, um, what color is the dog? How many paws does the dog have? You know, basic stuff. Every um, dog would have those properties, right? So you can think of a class as a blueprint, just like an architect would use to design a house. Once you have created the blueprints, you can then use it to create buildings with that design in mind. So the exact same thing is done for classes and objects. First, you make a class to design what data and functions the object will consist of, and then you create objects, which is known as instantiating the class. So we'll get plenty of practice with uh, you know designing classes and making objects. Don't worry about that. So yeah, I know I'm you know throwing a lot of information at your face right now and a lot of terminology, but don't worry, we'll get plenty of experience with doing all this stuff with designing classes and making objects, don't worry about that. And so yeah, now let's look at an example of a class. So on the screen right now is a very simple class definition that defines a car, which we'll then use to create car objects. As you see, the car consists of some crucial data relevant to what a car represents, the make, the model, the color, whether the car is electric, and its top speed, those are the variables that represent a car. And then you also see under that two functions which will speed up and slow down the car and in turn manipulate the data above behind the scenes. So whenever you call the speed up function, it's going to change the speed of the car. I guess there's not a speed variable, is there? That'll be, <laughs> I should have put a speed variable inside of the car. But, but yeah, if you call the speed up function behind the scenes, it's going to change a speed variable if there is one. And then if you call the break, it's going to you know decrease the speed variable if there is one, right? So it's going to be doing that, and we'll see how that works in the future, like I said. So, so to throw some more terminology at you, the data defined within the class are known as attributes. Right? These guys right here are known as attributes or member variables. I'll be calling them member variables because, because that's just what they're commonly referred to as in other languages too. And then the functions down here are called member functions. So member variables, member functions, or you can, all the, you can also call these attributes, the, uh, the variables here, okay? So all of this is the same exact thing we would do when defining a structure like we saw in the previous videos. You know, besides the inclusion of functions within the class, we didn't do that with structures, but you can do that, like I said. And the combination of data and functions together into one entity is a crucial part of object-oriented programming, so don't forget that. So now that we have defined what a car is, what a car contains, what it's made of, we can then create instances of the car class, which are known as objects. 
On the screen right now, we have defined three different cars using the car type defined by the car class, like we saw on the previous screen here. See? So now we have created these three objects, which we can use to create different cars. See, as you can see, we have three different cars here, car one, car two, and car three. And uh, each and every car object that is created will have the same variables and functions defined in the class from the previous slide. So they're all basically twins of each other. They all have the same attributes and member functions, and you can use them in different ways. We can give them each different values, but they'll all have those same uh, attributes and functions inside of them. And we'll see that, don't worry. But uh, there's more to learn when it comes to this, like access specifiers and such, and we will deep dive into all that in the future videos. But as you can see, creating and defining objects is a pretty simple process if you already understand the previous videos where we explore structures. So let's briefly talk about some of the core object-oriented principles present here. The concept of binding data and functions into one entity is called encapsulation. It's without a doubt the most important principle. Closely connected to that is data hiding, which is the practice of hiding access of member variables from outside the class. Restricting access of your class's data is a useful practice for a couple of reasons, including security and forcing the users of your class to use the functions of the class, rather than directly accessing the data and manipulating it however they want. Data hiding and encapsulation introduces abstraction into the picture, which is another core programming concept. Hiding the data of the class and making the user work with a specific set of functions means that they don't have to worry about the complex details of how the class works behind the scenes, they just need to focus on properly using the functions provided by the class or the object. A great and often used example of abstraction would be an airplane. If you have ever seen the cockpit of a Boeing 747, you would know there is some intricate machinery going on internally. Uh, but the pilot only has to worry about operating a few essential instruments like the throttle, the flaps, the landing gear, and the steering, you know, etc. There's, of course, you know, a lot more to operating an airplane than that, but those are the basics, you know, the basic instruments that a pilot would use. But if they can operate those few instruments pretty well, they can pretty much fly the airplane while the internals of the airplane are doing their own thing. The flight computer and all that stuff behind the scenes, they don't have to really worry about that. They just have to worry about the few instruments. So, so we can relate this directly to a class. The controls of the plane are the functions, and everything happening under the hood of the plane is the hidden data and procedures that we have you know, mentioned. And programming itself is an abstraction because our computer only really speaks one language, zeros and ones. Binary, right? But we can instead use a programming language like C++ to make the machine do whatever you want. So back to the concept of data hiding that I previously mentioned before, which allows you to hide you know, certain variables and functions within a class. This is done with two important keywords. There's actually three of them, but the two most important are public and private. So if a, let's for example, take a variable inside of a class. If the variable inside of a class is public, that means that anything outside the class can access that variable through the object. And then anything that's private cannot access anything outside of the class through the object, basically. And we'll see that later on, don't worry. I know that's pretty confusing, but we'll have a separate video on access specifiers, probably the next video or the next video after that. But uh, yeah, it's very important to be able to hide your data in classes and stuff like that. So yeah, so that's how that works. Use private and public, which are important keywords for that. So yeah, hopefully you now understand the core concepts of object-oriented programming, especially abstraction, which in essence means taking something complicated and then building layers upon it to make it more simple. Like I said, like maybe a programming language, right? You start off with something really complicated, like zeros and ones, ones and zeros, which is binary data, and you build layers upon it, and then you build layers upon it, and then eventually you come out with a really complex but easy to use language like C++ or Java or something like that, right? So yeah, hopefully that all makes sense. Okay, so now that we have covered the basics, let's jump into Visual Studio to get some practice making our first class and objects. All right, so I got Visual Studio open. Now we can create our first class here. Let's think about what we want to represent. I think we're gonna do a dog, so that's a very simple thing that we could represent as a class. Um, so yeah, let's try dog. So we'll do class dog. So you just gotta put the keyword of class and then the name of the data type that you want to create, in this case, dog. And then you open it up with uh, brackets here, curly brackets. And now we want to input the data that we want the dog to represent. So let's think about some of the attributes that a dog would have. Um, well, of course a dog is gonna need a name, right? So string name, we'll do integer age, age. We'll do integer number of paws. And then we'll do double health, so the health of the dog. And then, yeah, so that's pretty good. Those are some of the basic attributes that a dog would have. And we could also add some functions, like I said. So a object, as I told you before, is a entity that combines both data and functions together. And that's the really core thing about object-oriented programming. And um, so yeah, let's add some functions here. So let's think about what a dog would have or be able to do. Um, a dog can bark. So a dog would, we'll put void bark. And we're just gonna put the prototype for the bark function here. That's commonly what you would do 
with a class. So a class is going to serve as your definition, and then you would usually have a separate implementation file. So you would have a header file that is paired with the class where we provide all the code for the function prototypes. And we'll see that later on. Don't worry, I'll show you how to do all that. But yeah, for now, let's have just the prototype because that's the common practice you would do. And then let's have one more function here. We'll do void growl because a dog can growl. So yeah, those are our two functions that is for our dog here. And so yeah, let's try making a dog. So now that we've defined a dog, let's try making a dog. And um, so we'll do dog and we'll call this fluffy. So we'll make fluffy the dog and uh, we can leave it like that. So now we have just created our first dog named fluffy. So now let's try accessing one of the variables of dog, right? So with a, uh, a structure, we would use the dot operator, right? So fluffy dot, and then we would be able to access one of these variables here. But in this case, we can't access it right now because these are all private by default. So like I mentioned before in the slides, you would use the public and private uh, access specifiers to use data hiding to hide these uh, variables and functions here. In this case, for classes, everything is private by default. So that means that any of the variables and functions here cannot be used um, you know, with a object unless it's public, okay? And we'll see that later on, okay? So just you know, to fix this for now, put public and then a colon. And then now everything under that is going to be public. So it's accessible you know, um, outside of the class, basically. So now we can use the object with the dot operator to access any of these mem members here. So we could do fluffy dot and now you can see we have all these members here to access like number of paws and such. So let's try setting each of these uh, data members here. So name is equal to fluffy, fluffy dot uh, age, fluffy is gonna be three years old, fluffy dot number of paws, fluffy has four paws, hopefully, and then fluffy dot uh, health, or, uh, fluffy's health is gonna be 100. So that's how you access member variables of a class. Remember, these are member variables and these are member functions here. So let's say that we want to print out one of these member variables here. So we could do that if we want to. So we could do C out fluffy dot name or I'll do age fluffy dot age. And that should print out fluffy's age. So let's run this here and see what we get. So we should get three in the console. And there we go. We get three. It's a little small. I can't zoom in right now, but we can see that we have three in the console which is exactly what we expected. So yeah, so that's what we're able to do. We're able to create a dog and we can then access and set the member variables of a dog so that the dog has some you know, valid attributes because if you were to create a dog and, and not set the attributes, so let's delete all this. So just like we saw with structures a while back, if we were to create an object of the class dog and don't set any of these attributes here, it's gonna be filled with garbage values by default. So whatever happens to be, so at least for these primitives here, so whatever happens to be in these memory locations by default will be the values of these primitives here. So it could be like really random numbers here, basically. And then for strings, I believe it's just an empty string. That's just because uh, string is an object and we'll see that later on too. So basically, yeah, just remember to set each of these values here or you can even provide default values inside of the class, but we'll see that later on. Don't worry about that right now. So let's try going over some of the terminology again here. So whenever we create a class, that's called a class definition because you're modeling what the class of or the dog data type is going to be made of basically. But then whenever you create an object of dog, that's gonna be called an instance of the class. So we're using this, this blueprint here to create an instance of that blueprint, which is basically you can think of it as a physical representation of the blueprint that you have created the model, right? So, and then that instance is going to inherit all of the variables and functions that are defined in the class definition, okay? So one thing we saw a while back, whenever you create a new structure, you can give it an initialization list. So you can initialize each variable of the structure. So you don't have to you know, set them one by one like we just did a second ago. So we can do the exact same thing with an object. So we could do dog, dog2, which is creating a new instance of the dog. And then we could uh, give it some attributes here, as you can see. So we could give it a name. We'll call this dog Henry. We can give it an age, so six years old. Number of paws, it has two paws. Don't ask what happened to that dog, but. He has two paws and then we have an age, so 20.0 because it's a double. And yeah, so that's how you can set the default values for a dog. And then we can access each, each of those if you want to. So see out dog two dot number of paws and that should print out uh, two into the console. So let's see that. All right, so we get two, perfect. That's exactly what we expected. So yeah, you can set an initialization list if you want to, that's much easier to set a uh, dog, but um, you're not going to actually be using this too often whenever you're declaring new objects because we're going to be working with constructors. 
which is basically the same thing. And we'll see that, don't worry. We'll get plenty of experience. But uh, now what I want to do is show you how to use the object uh, functions, also known as the member functions um, of the object. So we could do, let's create a new dog here again. So we'll do dog uh, Bob. So our, our dog's name is Bob. And then now we could do Bob dot, and we could do either bark or growl. Bark, and then we call it, so we call bark, but as you can see, we get an error here because bark has not been defined and growl has not been defined. We've only given the uh, the class defi definition a prototype of bark and growl. So what we need to do is define them before we can use them, obviously, because there's nothing to you know run if there's nothing inside of them. It's just a prototype. So there's two things we can do. Um, we can either define it within the class itself. So we can do bark and then open this up here and say c out woof woof and then inline. But like I said before, you're usually not going to define a function within the class itself. You're usually just going to put the prototype. So this is not common practice. So the common practice in this case would be to define the function outside of the class definition. So right here, we could do it if we want to. So to provide the implementation for growl, we would need to put void. And then we have to use the scope resolution operator like we saw with enumerations. So we have to do dog colon colon and then put the name of the function that we want to target. So growl. And then now inside of here, we can provide the implant the actual code for it, right? So see out gr dot 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 and then inline. So I know that's a little weird. Normally when we make functions, we don't use the scope resolution operator, but with classes, you have to use the scope resolution operator to define or to uh, basically let the compiler know which uh, class growl is coming from. Okay. So that's how we do that. So we'll, if we were to have another class called cat and cat had growl also, we would have to do cat dot dot or scope resolution operator and then growl right so that's why that's important right because uh it has to know which scope the growl function is coming from in this case it's the dog scope or the dog class uh definition all right anyway so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense but now we can call these two functions here now that we have defined them okay so let's do bob dot and then we'll do bark and now it should print out woof woof into the console when we call this and there we go, we get woof woof, okay? And now let's do the second one. So uh, bob.growl. And now we can run this. And there we go, so we get grr into the console, perfect. So those are the two ways that you can define a function for a class. You can either do it within the class itself, or you can do it outside the class using the scope resolution operator. And normally we would put this inside of a header file, which we're gonna see very, very soon, so don't worry about that. But yeah, that's how you can do that. So this is how you can make classes from now on if you want to. And that's pretty much all I'm going to show you for this episode. So hopefully you understand the basics now. Like I said, or as you can see, it's pretty much the exact same thing as a structure, except that this time we're including functions into our class definitions. And then also, of course, we have to use the public keyword because everything by default um, is going to be private. So we have to specify it explicitly as public. All right. If you have any questions about what I showed you this episode, feel free to leave a question in the comment section below or join our Discord server. We have a big Discord server with over 1,300 members last time I checked, so if you need any help at all with your programs, you can hop into one of these help channels and get some help. You can also just hang out and get some new friends if you want to, so just make sure you click the invitation in the description below. Don't forget in the description below, I'll also leave a link to the code for this episode so you can come back to it at any time and use it as a reference. I'll leave good detailed comments around the code so you can have a good explanation in text form too, in case you don't want to watch my awesome videos again. One final thing I want to tell you about, if you want to support this channel, you can click the join button below this video, and you can join this channel as a member for as low as 99 cents a month. If you join, you can get cool perks like a special Discord rank on my server, early access to these videos, and you get shouted out like you see on the screen right now. If that sounds good to you, feel free to join for, like I said, as low as 99 cents a month. Alright, that's it. So thanks for watching. If you like this video, leave a like. If you want to see more, subscribe. And peace.